talking about do's and don'ts for starting a business. And our guest is James Alterbaum, and he's with the law firm Moses and Singer. And as you've heard, he's counseled many entrepreneurs and other people involved in startup ventures and ventures going on to the next level. Jim, before the break, we were talking about uh, some type of partnership or shareholder agreement just to prevent problems and to reflect what people agree to, especially before they start a business. What are some other things generally that should be covered in some type of agreement so there's no problem in in case of a business divorce? Okay, well, uh, the first thing to consider is the fact that in the absence of an agreement, uh, either party can freely sell his or her shares to a third party. So uh, the first thing is to at least restrict the sale of the shares so that if a third party wants to come in, both parties have an opportunity to participate. That's number one. Number two, what happens if one party decides to leave the part of the business? What happens to his or her shares? It's a waste with a startup to have or a young company to have somebody owning shares who's not a working partner. So there needs to be provisions for buyout in the circumstance of somebody departing. And then, of course, there's the question is what are the circumstances of departure? That's when you get into the question of valuation. What should be the buyout price and under what circumstances should a buyout be required? If somebody leaves under bad circumstances, it might be one price. If somebody leaves because there's just, you know, lack of uh, uh, amicability between the partners, it's a different kind of circumstance. Then there are the things such as, I mean, God forbid, death, disability, uh, things of that nature. What happens to the partnership? Uh, insurance is used as a vehicle in the event of death. Disability insurance is an expensive proposition, but is also a possibility. Uh, and then there are ultimately uh, the fundamental decisions of governance that go into any partnership arrangement. What happens if the company gets an offer to sell? What happens if it changes its line of business? What happens if it signs a lease? What happens if there are personal guarantees that are required? There has to be rules of engagement between the partners going forward so that when these circumstances arise, as they inevitably do, there are engagement rules. And these things have been thought out in advance and before these things occur. Because once they occur, there's always going to be disagreement and fighting. At least there's rules that govern the relationship and provide a guideline as much from a business point of view as a legal point of view. And by the way, this sort of dovetails into something that we always encourage entrepreneurs to do, which uh, we do all the time, which is what I call a legal audit of a business. Um, uh, There's actually a legal document which we put together, 15 pages, of all the necessary ingredients in starting a business, whether it's the choice of uh, organization, as you had indicated, Kenny, uh, corporation, LLC, or partnership, whether it's secondly, what kinds of uh, stock plans you might want to have for your entities, what kind of basic uh, contracts do you want to have with uh, with your customers and clients? One of the things that I always encounter representing younger companies is you want to look as big as you can. And folks uh, like to see that you actually have a form of agreement, a template that you use that nobody else has, so that you can appear larger and more important than you really might be perceived by the marketplace. Um, you also want to consider other things such as the choice of a good accountant, somebody can help with tax planning. Uh, you need to consider a whole bunch of things. And the legal audit basically is a discipline where we provide an entrepreneur a lengthy template of things to consider before they even proceed with their venture. And this way, it's, again, a check for the entrepreneur to say, gee, do I need this? Do I need that? Now, one of the things that one has to consider is not everything has to be done at once, but there usually would be, depending upon the type of product, the type of company, a prioritization of things. So we try to guide the entrepreneur to essentially, here are the things you really need to do right away. Here are the kinds of things you really don't need to do right away. And that, by the way, brings into the question of financing. Many people say, well, I, people say I need a million dollars right away. Well, you know what I find is that you don't need that right away. A lot of folks actually need money over stages. So therefore, my approach to financing, because you asked that question, is a great question, considering that it is tough to get a bank to finance a startup company or a young company in the initial stages, is to at least think about how much money and how much capital you need. Do a projection 12, 18 months out. See what you really need and when, do, when are you going to become cash positive? And then once you've made that determination, then go out and look for folks who are interested in investing. But a lot of times people think they need all the capital right away and they all, all they end up doing is diluting their interest so much that they uh, no longer control the company. There are many situations I've been involved with over the years where entrepreneurs forget 
that working for a company is not the same thing as owning it. You can have an entrepreneur who starts out with 51% of a company, gets diluted down, and all of a sudden he finds or she finds that she's fired or he's fired. So think about a strange thing. You should have an employment contract with your company, even though it's your company, because working is different than having an interest in a company. And I've had many experiences where entrepreneurs actually get voted out of office, lose their jobs, and have a non-compete provision, which prevents them from returning into the industry in which they're operating. So one has to be very cautious. And there are two kinds of capital, what I would call intrusive capital and non-intrusive capital. Non-intrusive capital really, as I earlier had stated, has to do with strategic folks, folks who are passionate about your business, who want to truly align themselves with you. And you could tell that right away by the nature of the type of security that they want in the company. When I say security, is it going to be common stock, which makes them aligned with your interest as a common stockholder? Or is it going to be preferred so that their money comes out before you as an entrepreneur? That realizes, that makes you realize that they're not on equal footing but want to have an advantage. Now, there's nothing wrong with an advantage except one has to understand that there's a cost to that advantage. And very much, um, you mentioned Shark Tank, for example, and angels, and those sound like wonderful things. And I'm not suggesting that folks who put their capital up don't take huge risks. They do. But having said that, there are circumstances where, uh, in fact, if milestones aren't met, and this is what investors always are looking for, they're looking for progress. They're looking to see if in three months the product goes from point A to point B, et cetera, et cetera. Many times in these deals, the milestones, if they're not met, what occurs is that the controlling interest of the company reverts away from the entrepreneur to the financing source so that essentially uh, you end up being an employee. And most entrepreneurs don't do this to become employees. And then, so there's real bad, bad consequences to not meeting those milestones. How does someone find investors? That's a great question. and it's, it's Especially uh, a startup. Well, there, there are, depending on the industry... A tremendous amount of financing for younger companies, uh, in particular areas like life sciences. For example, if we look at the great uh, inventions, the healthcare pharmaceutical inventions, these are all startup concepts. Uh, um, you know, so there is financing for that. One of the things I would caution folks, going back to one of the initial comments that was made, is that when you go to, let's say, the big pharma companies, when you go to these kinds of companies with ideas, you have to be very careful because they will not likely sign non-disclosure agreements because they'll say, oh, we had this idea. Or you go to venture capitalists, they say, we had this idea. Even universities, you've got that same problem because if, in fact, you're working with the university and you look at their website, they they may actually take the position that it's their intellectual property. But having said that, uh, the concept is to find an investor who is not interested in necessarily making a killing but is, wants to align his interest. And doing that is through common equity. Even giving them a, a discount off evaluation is worth it if their interest is aligned with you as opposed to somebody who, in fact, is trying to essentially look at this as totally a financial transaction rather than a transaction that's promoting well-being and things of that so nature. So they're almost like a philanthropist. Somewhat, somewhat. Uh, it's called friendly, non-intrusive money. It's out there in technology. We all know that technology is, of course, a young startup kind of situation. Uh, and in connection with technology, there are financing sources all over the place looking at technology companies. Um, you know, so is it almost like applying for a grant? There is actually, you mentioned it, there are grants available for companies. There are job action things that there are, there are so many different ways to get financing. The SBA provides financing for companies. There are things that one would not think are available that, uh, frankly, creatively create tremendous opportunities for younger companies. So big charities or governments or NGOs might have financing available for certain things. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, and in fact, it's a good time for this, this kind of opportunity. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit is very, very strong in this country, and the financing sources are adapting to that. Look at who are the five largest companies in America today compared to five or ten years ago. They're all technology. Uh, and they started from nothing. They started from nothing. and Someone now, had an idea, a billion-dollar idea. That's correct. Okay, we just have a few minutes left in the program. What other tips would you like to offer in terms of do's and don'ts, and especially if you want to talk about choosing a, an attorney and other professionals? Well, let, let me make the following observation. I, I always like to say to people, particularly who are starting out, that um, negotiation is probably the most important skill that you could possibly have in connection with any uh, situation. We all negotiate every day. 
But let me give you just a couple of quick tips. Um, time is always on your side. Very often, an entrepreneur is assiduous, is uh, uh, rigorous. Uh, most people don't have the time. So time is on your side. Let the other person make the first offer. Show indifference. Uh, information is power. Get as much information as possible. Have the ultimate decision maker not in the room. Serve food at a critical juncture. Uh, you shouting and screaming judiciously. Break off negotiations only if you handle the other person's bluff. Reduce the open points to a short list. I can go on and on, but the point of the matter is the art of negotiation is probably the most important skill for an entrepreneur to develop, and we negotiate every day. And choosing professionals, whether it's a, a lawyer, accountant, you want an advocate on your side. You want somebody who's not wedded to a financing source. You want somebody who's equally passionate about what you're doing and is willing to take the next step with and you. And with these negotiations, you don't want to say yes or no too quickly. You want to find out what your options are? Absolutely. You bunch the issues. You don't give on an issue. You group the issues. Then you come down to a finite number of issues. And there's always good and take, good give and take in a negotiation. And, and in the end, it's going to be some type of win-win relationship, something that works for them as well as you. Right. Nobody walks away from the negotiating table 100% happy. If there's too good a deal, there's going to be a problem. So a deal that's not 100% good is not a bad deal. And if one person's going to lose, whether it's you or the other person they're not it's not really going to be a sustainable uh, deal exactly the old expression no good deed gets unpunished so uh, that is correct Kenny okay we just have a few seconds later any other final suggestions for do's and don'ts my final suggestion is to when you're picking professionals make sure that they not only are good professionals but they can introduce you to folks that they can introduce you to financing sources they can introduce you to stuff any professional these days in my industry has to do something much more. And they've been through it before. Absolutely. I just want to remind everyone, whatever you've heard is presented as information only. You have to get legal and financial advice from your own lawyer or other professionals. You've been listening to James Alterbaum. He's with Moses Singer, and the website is mosessinger.com. And once again, you're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC the voice of Ness Community College in Garden City, Long Island, New York. Also over the internet at ncc.edu slash WHPC. And many shows can be found by searching WHPC on iTunes for a podcast. Please join us next week at the same time for another program on Law You Should Know.